And now for the very first <laughs> of our evaluations of the entries that we got for the second half, the second movement of Beethoven's 24th Piano Sonata from Emily. And Emily, you did a great job here. It, it really does feel very, um, very like late classical, early romantic in the scoring. You know, just very simple and straightforward and, uh, you know, not not too intense, not too um, stratified. Uh, I, I noticed that you left out the uh, natural horns. I think you could have put natural horns in there. I think you could have put timpani in there to sort of emphasize this last bar. But I'm going to completely play fair and evaluate this according to the evaluation criteria that I have made for this second movement, such as they are. <clears throat> a little confused because, um, as some people might remember from the uh, orchestrating Beethoven movement two video, um, I I didn't do like each section. I actually did um, each recurring section <laughs> because it was a rondo, right? <clears throat> and also because it's such a short piece, you know, it's just about maybe three minutes long or something, three and a quarter minutes long in its entirety. So <clears throat> with that, let's take a look at this double A section that you orchestrated. So yeah, so you, you, you did a very similar, um, you took a very similar approach um, that I, you know, to what I did in terms of kind of stacking two sets of, um, you know, the, the, the two, the right hand part, one on top of the other. So like you sort of doubled it in, in octaves with the flutes on top <clears throat> and kind of did the same thing both times with the violas taking the second voice here and then just doubling up the, um, the top voice in the first. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, I think just, you know, like you completely caught the whole idea. Shifts of dynamic and registers imply contrasts of textures and you, you know, and, and you just completely captured that really beautifully. Uh, there's a couple of extraneous things. I don't, I don't know why they're in the score. You, you'd probably, you know, thought to remove them later. Like you do not need, um, you do not need a, need a down bow here. Like nobody's going to play that up bow. So there's no need for you to indicate a down bow, right? So in fact, there's no need for you to indicate any bowing anywhere, uh, unless there's, you know, unless you know that it's going to go against the bowing that is usually, you know, that, that usually takes place. Or if there's a special case, you know a lot about bowing. There's a, some sort of special way of setting up the bow that you want. And there is really limited rehearsal time and you indicate what it is. And it, it can also give like, like for instance, if you have three up bows in a row, right? Um, like going into a down bow, <clears throat> that can give a little lift to the end of a bar, right? So things like that, right? That, that would be the only need, only reason for you ever to need to mark any bowing. All right, so, so it's, um, I would say the thing that you need the most work on here, Emily, is um, having like a, a cohesive uh, strategy of like slurring of phrasing and so on, right? So, so just kind of taking it from the beginning. Here you're going, da da, right? But the strings are going down, up, down, right? So I think you need to decide what you want to do because you have these two different, uh, like one is canceling out the other, right? So they're both canceling each other out. So like the the smoothness that you get here from the strings is being interfered by the violins and the nice choppiness of the violins here is getting interfered by the by the the winds right so you have to make a decision you have to make a commitment one or the other right and then um and then fall on either side of those camps right so um so i think that like you could just leave them out because that's just more exciting right dun, dun, dun. right so it just really gives a punch um on that little pickup into the next bar or like they could all be slurred da da right uh, um and of course there'll be like a little bit of lift at the end of the slur as as you well know as a great clarinet player you know that they'll just you know there'll be it's almost a staccato um you know at that kind of speed that kind of mood 
And then here we've got this da 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 da. So we've got this portato here, which I think is very very cool. And here, like since you have the same pitch, you've chosen to go ah ha ha ha. Right. So it's it has that um, as a really really cool kind of a kind of a. a sort of shoving kind of a quality I don't know, like portato right so it's it's kind of heavy and you're lifting right you're 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 porting it from one place to another now um you could have just had slurs without the portato and then just had this note here as just a quarter note right if you had wanted to make things smoother right so um you know portato there's a like there, the tenuto mark is part of the portato, so there definitely is going to be a sense of heaviness, right? Now that actually works in your favor here because you want like a really direct sound, even though you're soft, right? So you, you want the softness, but you really want that, uh, huh, huh, hum, you know, like just really kind of mm, underlining it. All right, and then like same comments here, same comments there. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I, I think that that all works pretty well. Um, one thing I would say is that, like, um, if things get really fast in the strings, like, too much portato, like, at a really fast clip can, you know, just can, uh, just, like, doesn't feel right, right? You end up, it ends up being mezzo staccato at best, or even just staccato, or, or you know, some kind of separated feeling um, with the bow in the same direction. Or they'll just cross it off. You know, and say, I can't play, I can't play Portato that fast. All right. So, um, so here, um, my evaluation criteria point out like, hey, you know, what does, you know, what do our genius pianists whom we've all to had to listen to, you know, what do they do when they get to this bar? Um, and they tend to sort of pull back a little bit, like Spencer Meyer goes, da, 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 and he just goes, you know, tempo one right in here, right? Uh, so, so it's okay to go meno here, right? Just to just to, and it also like gives it a little bit of grace and almost a little bit of doubt, or not really doubt, but just kind of like saying, hey, did you think of this alternative, which just sets sends the listener rocketing into this next passage here, so. Um, I, I think that like you don't have to do what I did, but you know, just a little bit of um, you know, just a little bit of pulling back there might really make this effective in pushing forward. Now, uh, one little thing just to point out, and that is, like here you have two slurred notes under, you know, that are the same, right? So I, I know you like you run into those all the time in parts and so on, but I think that. You know, I, I think that you could probably do better there, right? I, th I'd, I think two-part writing uh, with this bottom pitch as just a, you know, as just a half note, right? You, you probably get a, everything that you would want there. Or if you just really want them both articulated, maybe mezzo staccato on the bottom note. Once again, two-part writing. And it's really easy. I just like, um, if you want to, you can select both notes and you can click two, right? Or you can just go like I I always use the key command, which is like Option or Alt two, and then I've got my little guys there, and I can just put a uh, slur on that, and then I can put um, like little a little mezzo staccato there. Right? I don't I don't like the way that like you know like Sibelius should really like in situations like this, it should default to where the uh, hang on, I'm just going to zero in here. When it sees something like this, it should, you know, it should give its its little slur that kind of a shape, right? Just normally. Anyway. Okay. Uh, so, so yeah. So, da, 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 um, And, yeah, and also, like, you probably forgot uh, to put staccato there. And this is really cool. I really like the way that you um, have double reads, right? Uh, and here I would say, if you're going to go pianissimo, you don't need a due on bassoons. Just have a single bassoon there. That way you get this beautiful trio sound and very, very intimate. Much, much better, I'd say, than this. Um, you know, like this is, this is, you know, a great rock and roll texture, <laughs> such as it is, for, um, for 
that kind of playing. There's there's a gap of two octaves here. I'm not so sure that I am totally with you on that. Perhaps you'd intended for this to be an octave higher. I don't know, but like the the gap in here is is a little. Um, it, it just is a little kind of clumsy in the in the sound picture. Sorry, I just I forgot to mention that before. All right, so now going back to here, um, I, I think that in this situation you could tell me how many of each, like two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons. You're probably looking at it going, ah, I forgot to put that in. Um, I think if you're going to go with Roman numerals, you should mention it here, like flutes I, and then ampersand I I, right. Right, and then like then that kind of gives you permission to do this, and, and then if you just like you use, it's just a style thing I think. If you just use like um, you know the um, if you use like Arabic numerals, then you would just like then you might say like one, you know, right. So anyway, all right. All right, so to get back into this section going, you know, heading headlong but towards B. Um, once again, I think like there's a little bit of room here for um, a, a bit more consideration to the um, to the slurring, to the shapes of the phrasing, and so on. Um, so uh, yeah, just, this is just way too long. I think you know, duh, uh, Right? I mean, is that does that you know just like bow that in your mind? Duh. Uh, I mean, it's yeah. It's just what if it were da da da? Right? Just like do one bow per bar, right? And that way, like the this can start down bow and then up bow into the big crescendo and then a nice down bow right on the forte, almost as if it were an accent, right? And then same thing here. Go, um, you know, all down bow and then. Um, you could go like do -dee -do -dee. I mean I I think I see why you're doing this like you're you're thinking down bow and then I can go up down up down up or hang on hang on sorry down up down up down and, and you know I mean it's just a little weird I, it, it's I think it's better to give this the down bow right and if you slur from here then that'll be the up bow right slur like up down up down up down yeah, and then once again, same thing. Like, say here you divided it, right? So, and you didn't do it that here. And here, of course, you should just give this. You should give this guy, a, a you know, a down bow stroke. And then once again, fix this up bow, then down, up, down, up, and so on. Now, um, the other thing is like, if you're going to do that with this, then you should do that with your bassoons as well. So that like, and then you should probably mark staccato, or you know, if you had any kind of like, if you really have that kind of feeling of bounce. You should indicate it in the parts. I mean, especially if you're going to have that in your upper winds here, right? That bop, 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 bop. And then, you know, here I would, what I would do is with these parts, uh, um, right? Just to, just, it's just cleaner. And it's just easier than going a due and then having an interval a due and then having an interval, right? It's, it's just, uh, just faster. Uh, easier on the um, the score reader and the and the copyist and the conductor and so on. So yeah, so this is cool. Um, da, 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 ba, 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 ba. Um, you know, I almost feel like you could get away with two crescendos here, like with the way that you've got it scored. You know, you know, I think you could you could just like just drop back down here to subito piano and then push again. Um, and, you know, it just would really, you know, it would like really pull the audience, pull the listener in. Yeah, and, and like, I mean, if you're happy with that as a clarinet player, uh, then that's cool with me. Um, I would have like a, I would have, I would have the impulse to more like maybe, maybe like divide this into, into separate bars um do ta ta cuz like i i would want like a ta at the on the downbeat of each bar yeah and this is very very cool now if you had wanted like to get some more excitement into this <laughs> emily like you know like just really <laughs> make it very very beethoven like um and and to sort of bring back the feeling of those crazy tuplets uh that are in the piano score you could always do like um some doubling here from your completely unused uh, first and second violins, 
and then just have them play this, um, play everything that your flutes are doing, uh, but having have them play it as you know as da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da -ga, right <laughs> so so you know instead of it would be with the um with your strings i mean it wouldn't be instead but it would be alongside so right so you could have the you could have the strings basically playing the same thing as this so just like give the top part to the uh to the first and the bottom part to the seconds right I mean, and, and as far as that goes, like you could be separating this up between the um, the uh, oboe and the flute. But but I I mean I I know why you have just flutes here, and that's because you just finished having the oboe do something, right? So you kind of want to get away from that sound. And since you're starting soft and low, uh, the that second flute will come through fine, right? So what I would say is then just do the same thing here, so your first clarinet doesn't drown out the second flute there, right? So just jump back to pianissimo. And then push forward to forte again by this bar. And yeah, and, and if you want to add excitement, like I said, just go yo chugga 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 with your um, with your second violin sort of doubling the stuff above. Um, and then especially here, you know, bow, you know, like <laughs> right at the end there. Uh, and and like I said, I totally think that you could have worked in um, uh, timpani and uh, and natural horns. Right, I think that that would have been it would worked perfectly into your scheme, and like you, you wouldn't even need to bring them out until you wanted some a little bit of blaze here at the end, you know, just like that wonderful, glorious color. Um, there's kind of a lot of talk about uh, John Elliot John Elliot Gardner being a bit, you know, aggressive and toxic and so on um, as a conductor, uh, and and you know, uh, but like his. That that doesn't mean you shouldn't listen to some of the work that his orchestra did, you know, on behalf of those players and the the excellent work that they have done, like especially um, the um, the natural trumpet and natural horn players that are on those Beethoven recordings. Those guys are top notch. So like, you know, I mean, every time I listen to them, I I learn something new, <laughs> right? And also uh, Hanover Band um, has got just the most awesome excellent um uh natural brass players just oh yeah and also just like you know and they're playing those kind of old style um uh classical early romantic era um trombones and so on there are two or three really fantastic uh period instrument orchestras of that time you know beethoven's time with really excellent um uh beethoven cycles beethoven symphonic cycles some including like all the overtures, <laughs> like um, like Coriolan, with you know with a period orchestra is just riveting. You know, that is like one of the most intense, gripping pieces of music I have ever heard. You know, in with the original scoring, with like just you know with kind of normal modern instruments, it's like oh yeah, it's another Beethoven overture. But like with the original instruments, you know that is one of the strongest arguments. Also, like Consecration of the House Overture, which some people think is sort of boring. Like when you hear it in its original sound, it is like it pulls you in and it keeps you there. That, at least that it does for me. So um, so anyways, I just think that this is one of the best things you've ever sent me, Emily. And, um, and you know, I've always thought that you were a really fine composer and, and of course, an excellent clarinet player, especially of low clarinets. If anybody's out there, go check out Emily's channel. Um, where I think she might still have um, some of her um, some of her her work, uh, especially I think some pieces for uh, contra alto clarinet. Just just choice, beautiful low register playing and just warm that warm dark chocolatey kind of a sound. Emily understands like um, you know like few other composers, sort of like you know because like you know the proponent right is can sometimes say the thing on the instrument that is you know maybe the wisest or the most you know, brings out the most of the color so yeah um and it taught me a lot about those instruments too so check that out so and thank you for that emily so anyway um I don't have anything else to say about this except that I'm so excited that this was our first dig at Movement 2, you know, that which I think is just hell on wheels, you know. It is just so exciting, so fast, so insane, so 
uh, so lively. I'm so glad that you left it in at 144. <laughs> you know, it just really needs that kind of that kind of drive. Um, but you know, nothing nothing against anybody who dropped it down to 126 or 132 or whatever. That's all. That's all good. 138 it still works. So anyhow, excellent work. And that kind of finishes our evaluations for the minimum level of Patreon supporters. And it's really a shame because I really like the little. Um, uh, the little Beethoven at 11 years old painting that I've been using for the thumbnails and for the uh, for the opening, uh, like for the opening of these evaluation videos, um, it, might, it might not be Beethoven. Some people feel that it isn't Beethoven, but I don't know. I mean, who else could it be, right? Uh, but yeah, um, but I, I feel that that's the most successful thumbnail <laughs> um, of all of them. It has beautiful colors and it really pops out um, on the uh, YouTube page. So sadly, that will come to an end. And we will move on with a lot of excitement and anticipation now to the semi-brev uh, contributions, of which there is at least one of these Movement 2 offerings, okay? So I will just see you there tomorrow.